So in the next 12 minutes, I'd like to give you a brief tour of my Black Shoals option pricing model, and I'll highlight three of the questions that we get often about this famous model. So that would be first, how are dividends exactly treated? Secondly, can we interpret N of D1 and N of D2? And third, is there any way to get an intuition about how this Black Shoals works, short of going all the way back to the differential equation? So here's my relatively simple one-page option pricer. It returns the price of a call and a put for a European-style option according to the classic Black Scholes Merton. And you can see here in yellow, I have the input assumptions. The values that I have in here originally or initially to seed them happen to match John Hole's 15.9 example. So that's chapter 15 if you're following along. And you'll see that they do return the call and put prices that match his in the text. So that's the point of the model, to take these input assumptions for the option and return for us a price for the European call and the European put, right? We want to keep in mind, small c, small p, that denotes European. This is an option that can be exercised only at maturity if there is positive intrinsic value. And so we're getting $4.80 for the call and about 81 cents for the put. My model has the put call parity in here. You don't need this. You could delete this without any impact. I just like to include it when I'm writing questions or answering questions or doing exercises as a gut check or, or just to make sure that I'm comfortable I'm getting correct numbers because for European options here, put call parity should apply. So I should get a match here between on the one hand, let's say the left hand side of the equation, right? We have what I call call plus discounted cash. Discounted cash is the strike price discounted continuously at the risk-free rate over the term. Notice in this set of assumptions, it's a six-month option. So on that side of the put call parity, I'm getting $42.81 for my call plus discounted cash. And then I compare it to what can be easily called a protective put, right? The price of the put plus the initial stock price. You see how easy that is. Put 81 cents plus initial stock price 42 is 42.81, and these need to match. I include that to give me comfort that my numbers are incorrect, are correct, and you'll see that they uh, are correct. Whoops! If I just change the volatility, for example, to 30 percent, you'll see they match. Put call parity applies. My formula is correct. I do have here also, I've teased out specifically the dreaded D1 and D2. I think, the, I think of these as the inner Black Shoals because you can see they are inside the Black Shoals, right? Here's the Black Shoals formula for the European call and the D1 and D2 are inside these N functions, which are, it's a handful, cumulative, standard cumulative normal distribution functions or cumulative standard normal distribution functions. Really what they are is they are returning for us a probability based on being given a quantile. That's all they do. And then in this case, more specifically, the quantile is the quantile of a standard normal distribution. And we typically denote that as a special case of the quantile with a Z. So standard normal cumulative distribution function is just taking a quantile and returning for us a probability. And so then we have the formula for a call, and you can see I implement that here. Same formula we see here. And then for a put, really the terms are just reversed. We start with the strike price, and we subtract the adjusted stock price, so to speak. But you can see the cumulative standard normal cumulative distribution functions take negative D1s D, negative D2, D1 instead of positive D1, D2. Quick note about the dividend because this sheet does, you'll see, incorporate a dividend. So just for example, I'm going to now go from a non-dividend paying stock to a stock that pays, let's say, 3% dividend. What do we expect? Well, we expect the call price to be reduced and we expect the put price to be increased, actually. So I'll do 3%, and that is the outcome. So about that dividend, I'll tell you the most common question that I've gotten over the years is, 
are we doing it in both places, so to speak? And the answer is yes. Or put another way, we do it consistently. You'll notice here in the D1 and D2, this is in whole chapter 15. He saves this for later for some reason to add the dividends back in. But you'll notice in D1 and D2, this continuous dividend yield, it is subtracting in both of them. So it's part of the inner, what I call the inner black shoals in the D1, D2. Answer is yes, you subtract the dividend. And then also notice, it also is part of the outer, what I call the outer um, black shoals. In other words, it is as usual, I'm gonna bring that back out, as usual, the dividend is effectively reducing the stock price right here and right here. So that most the answer to that most common question is yes, we do it consistently, both inside the inner D1 and D2, and, and we discount in the outer Black Shoals as well. And so um, finally, you can see my model in on this page goes to the trouble of building out the D1, right, manually, and then using Excel's function here uh, to compute the standard, standard normal cumulative distribution function here as a function of the D1. And the D2 here, taking the shortcut, D2 is a function of D1, just subtracting volatility scale by the square root rule. And then taking, again, standard normal dis cumulative distribution function to go back and, and finally to roll that all up into the call option. Is there any way to intuit, uh, have an intuition about this? Well, I think there's a couple ways to approach an intuition about this without going all the way into the theory. My favorite way to do it, which doesn't really, isn't really supported by the science behind it, my favorite way to memorize or to think about this intuitively, if not to memorize it, is to just think about the minimum value, what we call the minimum value of a call option. And if you're studying this as part of the part of the FRM or CFA, this would have come before. And it's much easier to access the intuition of the fact that this must be the minimum value of a European call option. It's the stock price minus the discounted strike price. Not too hard to get to that intuition. And then I'm going to leave the dividends out right now. And then the way that I just think about this is then we're just wrapping in those cumulative normal distribution functions and they adjust this up for volatility. That's how I think about this. We take a minimum or memorize it anyway. We take a minimum value, it's intuitive, and then we're adding N and D1 and D2 as multipliers. We're wrapping them to to juice this up, to increase this value as a function of volatility. Not very scientific, but maybe it's helpful in terms of memorizing. Another way to go at it is what Hull has introduced in or more recent additions is this formula here using N, N of D1 and N of D2. After all, what do they mean? Well, N of D1, as we go study later with the Greeks, we'll see N of D1 is the, call, is the delta of the call option. That is to say, right, the uh, change in the call price with respect to a change in the stock price is option delta. And for a call, it's N of D1. N of D1 is the call options delta. N of D2 is actually very, is much easier to get at or to just summarize. This is the probability of exercising a call option. So put another way, this is the probability that at maturity of the option, the stock price will be greater than the strike price. So you can see how it truly is a probability. With that understood, if we go to this expression here, which after all is a rearrangement really, then we can isolate on this quantity here. I'm not doing that very well. And this is the expected future stock price in a risk neutral world when the stock price lower than the strike price is counted as a zero. So it's sort of unconditional. And then divided by N of D2, which we said is the probability of exercise, makes this quantity here 
something of a conditional probability. It is the expected future stock price if the option is exercised. So it's a conditional future value of the stock price. And we can there then just subtract the strike price, giving us a conditional future value of this option, really a conditional estimate of its future intrinsic value by itself. And we can multiply that by the N of D2, which, produce, which uh, accounts for the fact that if it doesn't get exercised, it's worth zero. So what's the weighted average value? If we, we want to include the zeros, we would need to multiply by the probability. In other words, we're giving a zero to, to every outcome where the stock is less than the strike price. So we take that conditional and go back out to an unconditional future value of the call or intrinsic value, and then discount it back to today. So a little harder there, but I thought an elegant way for help for Hull to approach an intuition around the call option. But if nothing else, I would remember that uh, N of D1 is the call option delta for a call, and N of D2 is the probability that the future stock price will be greater than the future stock price will be greater than the strike price. So hopefully that's helpful. And if you like this video, please subscribe to the channel. And so you can be notified of our future updates. Thank you.